I wanted to reflect for a moment on the title of the series, Losing My Religion. Um, some of you probably know it was a very famous song by R.E.M. But the question I wanted to reflect on was, who is it referring to? When we have this as our focus, who are we referring to in terms of losing their religion? Uh, who is the intended audience for our sessions? And as you can see, there are two audiences. There's you, but then there are people out in YouTube land. And that might be a very, very different crowd. So when I'm speaking, personally, I'm very, very sensitive to who I'm speaking to. And I just wanted to sort of give you a warning or a caveat that I know who you people are to some extent. But I will be speaking to probably a more general audience as well. So please be uh, just okay with that, that we're going to be going beyond our group here to speaking to a little bit of a larger group. But a more important distinction needs to be made in terms of the audiences. Um, who is it that's losing their religion? So I think basically from... My focus in terms of where we're going to be heading, there are two groups that I think that we need to be attentive to. Number one are people that never really connected to Judaism in the first place. Meaning that for many Jewish people, it's not that they were ever connected to Judaism and then they lost it. For very large numbers of Jewish people, it never clicked in the first place. And so I'm going to be a bit attentive to that group. In addition, however, there are people who are actually committed Jews, practicing Jews, what you might call religious Jews. And for various reasons, they begin to stray from observance and their faith begins to weaken and so I will try to focus on that group as well. As you can see, these are two very different groups. And it's going to be a little bit difficult to do this dance where we're addressing both groups simultaneously. I will try my best. My personal experience has been that most people don't really reject Judaism they reject, unfortunately, a very sad caricature of Judaism. They tell a famous story of Isaac of Chelm, one of the wise men of Chelm. And he's walking down the street one day, and he sees who he thinks is an old friend. And he says, Jacob, is that you? He says, I can't believe it. You know, Jacob, I remember you used to dress nicely, your clothing was put together, it was tailored, you were well-groomed, your hair was cut neatly, your beard was trimmed nicely, and look at you now, you look horrible. Your clothing's a mess, your hair is all out of whack, what happened to you? And the fellow says, excuse me, I'm not Jacob. And he says, and look, you went and you changed your name too. <laughs> so sometimes we assume that we are confronting something, we know that we're dealing with something, but it may not really be the reality that we're confronting. Rav Levi Yitzhak of Berdichev, the holy Hasidic master, was once confronted by someone who said, listen, Rabbi, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. And Rav Levi Yitzhak said to him, listen, I just want you to know one thing. The very same God that you don't believe in, I don't believe in that God either. So who is the God that the atheist is rejecting? And I would advance the suggestion that often it's not the God of Judaism. So when I say that for many people, they don't reject Judaism, they're rejecting a caricature of Judaism, I think that is an important thing to bear in mind. Often when people don't have a full understanding of a topic, meaning People have a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of understanding, but there's a much bigger 
picture, to consider much more information. So having just a little bit of knowledge or not a full spectrum of knowledge often does not serve us well. And the antidote is not always simply receiving more information. The Baal Shem Tov tells a story that there was a person who was wandering in the forest and he came across a very, very strange building. It wasn't high, it was just one story tall, but it was very, very long. You can imagine a building that goes for 300 yards. I mean, it's massive. And there's a window on one end of this long building. And this fellow comes over to the window and he peeks in and he sees in the middle of the room, he's able to see that far, there are about 100 people and they're running around in circles and they're jumping up and down and he sees something that looks a little bit strange. The Baal Shem Tov pointed out he had two handicaps. Number one, his vision was cut off because uh, the, the peripheral vision couldn't see all the way down to the other end of the room. He could only really make out about half the room. So his vision was curtailed, and this particular person happened to be so hard of hearing, he was practically deaf. So he didn't see, on the other end of the room, there was a few people playing music. And he can't hear them. So all he sees is a hundred people in the middle of this room running around in circles, jumping up and down, doing somersaults. What does he assume? He assumes he's come to a mental institution. He can't imagine what else is going on. And the Baal Shem Tov said how sad it is that he can't hear the music. Had he been able to hear the music or see the musicians, he might have figured out, oh, there's some kind of a celebration going on. And that's actually what was happening in that room. It was a wedding. And these hundred people were dancing and celebrating with the bride and groom. So many people today, unfortunately, for whatever they know about Judaism, they don't hear the music. Or they hear an off-key kind of Judaism. But there may be even a larger problem. And that's when people hear the wrong music. <clears throat> Back in the early 70s, I was a freshman at Northwestern University out near Chicago. And that year, Cat Stevens had his premier album, Teaser and the Fire Cat, which I was crazy about. And I used to sing the songs all over the place. And one song that I loved, I thought the song was called The B String, and I would run around my dormitory singing it to my roommate, B string, make me happy, come on the B string, right on the B string. So one day my roommate says to me, Skoback, it's peace train, you idiot. Here I'm talking about a B string. What's going on with the B string? And that happens so often that we hear the wrong music. A friend of mine told me that he knew someone in New York that when they heard the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, they thought the Beatles were singing about the girl with colitis goes by instead of the girl with kaleidoscope eyes. So this is a serious issue. What are people's impressions of Judaism? What are they understanding? What are they experiencing? What do they really appreciate? Now we know that in any debate, any time you get into a discussion or a debate, you know that you are seriously handicapped when your opponent gets to define the terms of the discussion. Meaning, if the opposition gets to frame the discussion, you are really going to have to go uphill. For example, I don't want to get political tonight, but in any discussion, let's say, about what's going on in Israel, it makes a tremendous difference whether you talk about occupied territory or disputed territory, right? Once the discussion is defined as it's occupied territory, right, that's a much more difficult position to be in than to say, no, it's actually 
territory that's disputed. I think one of the challenges that Judaism faces is that it's classified as a religion. The title for tonight's class is called, Is Religion Killing Judaism? And I think to an extent, it's one of our big problems. You know, when you play this game as children, animal, vegetable, or mineral, right? What is it? <laughs> How do you classify something? So when people would ask, what is Judaism? Where does it fit in? People would say it's a religion. What else are you going to call it? And I think, unfortunately, religion and the impact that that word has carries a tremendous amount of negative baggage and negative associations. And I believe that Judaism suffers through those associations. Let me share just a few examples. People often will say that religions are restrictive. They're stultifying. They cramp our style. It's a bunch of do's and don'ts. Do this, don't do that. And if that's what religion is, if you see religion as basically rules to torture you, of course people are not going to gravitate towards religion. They tell a very cute story that in the creation of the world, everything that was created came to thank God. So this animal comes to God and says, God, you are the coolest God on the planet because look at me. Anyone tries to mess with me, I give off the worst smell imaginable and they run away. Thank you, God. And the next animal says to God, God, you're great. Anyone comes to mess with me and I shoot these spikes out at them and they go running. And the next animal comes and says, God, this is so cool. Anyone comes to get me, I can camouflage myself. They can't even see me. And the next animal comes and says, God, I am so huge. The elephant says, no one's going to mess with me. And every single animal comes and says, look, uh, I'm so fast, no one can catch me. Until there's one animal that comes and it says, where is the complaint department? I'm very upset. So God says, what's the problem? And the little bird says, what's the problem? Are you crazy? Look at me. I have these skinny little tiny legs. I could hardly walk. And on my back are these ridiculous clumps that weight me down. I'm a sitting duck for anyone that wants to get me. And God says, you don't understand. Those clumps on your back are wings. And with those wings, you can fly. So when people think about, as an example, Shabbat, there are people who do see Shabbat as 25 hours of torture and being in prison. You can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And it may be possible for people to reframe that and to say, maybe this is a day of incredible liberation. You know, it's so interesting. I was in a bookstore yesterday and I noticed there's a whole literature now, not Jewish literature, a whole literature about the Sabbath and about taking a media break. And I think one, the la latest book was called 24-6. But there's the realization now that we've become enslaved, not to our desire for a break, we've become enslaved to the technology that was created in order to liberate us. And now it has taken captive of us. And so the idea that we have a day where we basically don't engage with so many of the things that we do routinely, it can be seen from one perspective as, boy, that sounds like torture. On the other hand, for many people that experience Shabbat, they say, I wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. It's a day of peace, of liberation, of beauty, of freedom. Another association with religion, I used to hear this a lot when I was first exploring Judaism. People would say, they pat me on the head in a condescending way, and they would say, you know, Michael, religion is very nice if you need it. Like a crutch for people that, unfortunately, are very weak. There's a comedian, I think he was Canadian, actually. Canadian comedian David Steinberg. 
And uh, he recounted once an interesting experience he had on an American television show. Where did this idea come from that religion is for the weak? Religion is a crutch. Religion is if you have problems. So I think one of the reasons, one of the ways that that conception became popular is if you watch the way the ambient religion in North America is promoted. If you ever watch the way Christianity is promoted, let's say if you ever, unfortunately, you can't sleep and you're watching television at three in the morning. So basically the message is if you have money problems, if you have a problem with your kids, problem with your wife, problem with your job, problem with drugs, problem with your health, come to Dr. Jesus and he will make you better. So the way this religion is promoted is it's promoted as a solution to your problems. And hence, I believe this association of religion is for people that are weak or have problems or difficulties and need some kind of a solution to their problems. So David Steinberg was on a television show in the same studios as Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts was the first major faith healer on television. He used to do these programs where people would come to him in a line and he would smack them in the head and they would be healed. So David Steinberg, a wise guy Jewish kid, walks up to him and shakes his hand and he walks away limping. That's what David Steinberg does. <laughs> The truth is, as someone wise once said, that real religion is not to comfort the afflicted. Real religion is to afflict the comfortable. But more about that later on. A third example. Uh, people often think of religion as superstition. I remember when I was in high school, I was obsessed with a film by Stanley Kubrick called 2001 A Space Odyssey. So if you ever had the pleasure of seeing this film, it begins with a beautiful panoramic view of this nature, big desert scene, and there are dozens and hundreds of apes that are having a great time. And all of a sudden, this huge rectangular black monolith lands in front of the apes. And these animals don't know what to make of it, and they approach it very gingerly, they're a bit scared, and they go up to it, and they touch it, and they run away, because what is this thing? That was their reaction to this mysterious object. I remember in 1979, my first time I went to Israel, so I used to I just, I, I like to watch people. And I used to go to the Western Wall in Jerusalem, and I used to just like to watch people going to the Western Wall. And to me, it looked almost the same, that people would approach the Western Wall and they would sort of very carefully touch it, and then they'd back away as if there was something to be afraid of. Meaning that people, I think, do have very, very superstitious associations with religion. Anyone that's a rabbi will tell you that People don't treat you like you're a normal human being, right? You're a rabbi. Ooh. There was a, a cute article in Moment magazine many years ago about rabbis' wives. And some of the rabbis' wives said it's very difficult to be married to a rabbi because your congregants think that you're sleeping with God at night. <laughs> so uh, for some reason, this is not helpful when people look at religion in superstitious kinds of ways. One last just introduction to this topic is that people often see religion as bureaucracy, as overly institutionalized, as overly structured. We call it organized religion. And it's not a healthy association. In 1998, I went to India with my wife to help run Passover Seder's in Dharamsala, in northern India, for about 200 Israeli travelers. And we sat in a room, you know, about this large. And there were no chairs, no tables, everyone was on the floor. And I was sitting next to a woman who was not from Israel, she was actually American. She was from the west coast, from Los Angeles. She was a single mom, she had two kids. 
And she was actually not traveling through India. She was living in this town. Dharamsala was a town of three streets with running sewage going through the sides of the streets. And I asked her during the Seder, I mean, we had an eight-hour Seder. Our Seder was eight hours. And I, at one point, I turned to her and I asked her, how did you end up here in Dharamsala? And she said to me, you know, when I was in California, she said, I tried going to synagogues. And she told me that my experience was I'd go to a synagogue and it would be this meeting and that meeting and sisterhood and brotherhood and this committee and that committee. And she turned to me wistfully with a tear in her eye and she said, you know, I was only trying to find a place where I could go and be reverent. I was just trying to find a place where I could sit quietly to be at peace. And she expressed her encounter with Judaism as basically an institution, as a bureaucracy. And that wasn't, for her, helpful. So I think that, again, becomes, for many people, a point that turns them off. Now, when I was growing up as a teenager, I was a very near casualty of a toxic association that I had with religion. I was a very idealistic young person. I was obsessed with world peace. I probably sounded like a Miss America contestant. What are you interested in, Michael? World peace. And uh, I saw religions as evil. That was my impression of religions, because to me, religions divided people. They caused strife in the world. They caused conflict. They caused wars. And I was not interested in that. And to me, religions were the problem, not the solution. Today, in the quiver of today's atheist activists, today's fundamentalist atheists, this is one of the most serious arrows in their quiver. The fact that religion is evil, it does violence, and they point out all the acts of religious extremism and terrorism. So this is a serious issue. And for me, it was a tremendous turnoff. So I mentioned that I went uh, after high school to Northwestern University, and I became very active there in the anti-war movement. As you probably remember, some of you, there was American conflict in Vietnam and in Cambodia, and I didn't go to many classes. I was very involved with the anti-war movement. And in the last semester, we had a trimester system there. We had a moratorium that basically tried to close down the school. We boycotted classes. We put up roadblocks. We tried to block traffic in the middle of this main street. And we organized a hunger strike. And a number of us were not going to eat anything for a week. Some of us, like myself, extended this for three weeks. No food at all. We just had 3,000 cc's of fruit juice a day. And we had a tent where the people that were striking were basically hanging out. And there was a sign on the tent that said, Juice for Peace. But so many of us in the tent were Jewish. We, we joked and we said they should say Jews for Peace. So it was interesting that a number of my classmates were young Jews who were actually exploring Judaism for the first time in their lives. They actually developed an interest in trying to see what Judaism had to offer them. And they were very, very much taken aback by the extreme antipathy they saw that I had towards religion and to specifically Judaism, my religion. And one of the challenges they offered me was, listen, for someone that has such a problem with Judaism, such an issue with it, they said, it strikes us odd that you seem to know nothing about Judaism. So wouldn't it make more sense, they challenged me, before you reject it forever, to first find out what it is. And because I was an open-minded kid, and I also must have felt a little bit guilty going to a very expensive university and not really attending classes. I left Northwestern University and I transferred to a special 
program at Yeshiva University in New York for wayward Jews. They had a special program there for people who never had a Jewish education. And I must say that I was totally shocked and surprised to learn that what Judaism actually stood for was the exact opposite of what I assumed it was. That here my assumption was that Judaism has actually, it's the opposite of trying to make this world a better, more peaceful place. And now I'm learning for the first time in my life that no, Judaism has always been dedicated to transforming this world into a utopia. That has basically been the vision of Judaism from day one. The Jewish Bible does not begin by talking about the Jews. It begins by talking about the world, the creation of the world. And ultimately, the Jewish Bible's conclusion, where it's heading, is towards the messianic age where all human beings live together in peace. And the Jewish people were constituted for what purpose? So the Torah makes it very clear. In the very beginning of our story, as soon as God calls out Abraham and says, go to the land I'm going to show you, he says, and you will be a blessing to the rest of the world. You are here to basically be a blessing to the rest of the world. That's from day one. And then when they come to Mount Sinai and they're about to receive the Torah, God says to them, you're going to be a Nation of priests, kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What does it mean to be a kingdom of priests? So among the Jewish people, we have Kohanim, we have priests. And what is their task? Their task is to be teachers to the rest of us. The priests did not have jobs. They didn't work. They were supported. They did go to the temple and maybe spend a day to a week in the temple every year. But the rest of the year, they were teaching. And so the Bible says that's our job vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. We're somehow supposed to be teachers. The prophet Isaiah says twice that we're supposed to be a light to the nations. We're here to basically be a light. Not to create darkness, but to create more light. And to bring about what the Bible speaks of. A perfect world, a utopian world, a beautiful world of peace and love and Woodstock. That's basically the Bible's vision. Why was Abraham chosen? So it's very interesting. When you read the Bible, you'll see that Abraham is not the first good guy. Actually, Noah is described in terms greater than Abraham. The Bible says that Noah was not just righteous, was perfectly righteous. The Bible never says that about Abraham. So why is Abraham the one to be the progenitor of this nation of priests. And one of the things I learned when I first came to this school in New York was that they each faced the same exact challenge, but they reacted very differently. Both Noah and Abraham were told by God that the world is going to be destroyed. God says to Noah, there's going to be a flood. It's going to wipe everyone out. I want you to build a big boat, and you will go on it with your family, and you'll be saved. And Noah basically says, okay, you're God. You must know what you're doing. You say jump. I say how high. And Noah's very obedient, and he does what God asks him to do. God comes to Abraham with the same news. Abraham, I'm destroying Adma and Sivoyim and Sodom and Amorah, basically the major population centers of the world. And Abraham goes crazy. And Abraham says, what are you talking about? Shall the judge of the whole world not do justice? He calls God out and says, it's not right. He says, will you kill the righteous with the wicked? How could you, God, kill everyone? What if there are righteous people in those cities? So Abraham says to God, what if there are 50 righteous people within the cities? And if there aren't 50, how about 45, 40, 30, 20? It goes down to 10. And Abraham basically says if there are 10 righteous people in the cities, what should be his next line of argument? Meaning he began by saying, will you kill the righteous with the wicked? He didn't seem to have a problem if people are so wicked that they need to be wiped out. But he says, you're going to kill the righteous people as well? 
So it sounds like where he's going is, look, God, if there are 10 righteous people, at least remove them from the cities and then kill everybody that's evil. He doesn't say that. He says, if there are 10 righteous people, you have to save everyone. Why is that? So his language was very precise. He didn't just say 10 righteous people in the city. He said, betoch ha'ir, within the city, meaning for Abraham, having 10 people cloistered in a monastery by themselves, isolated, was not going to do the trick. Abraham's thesis was that if there are such 10 righteous people living amongst everyone else, they have the potential to change and impact everyone else by setting an example. And so Abraham says, God, it would be not righteous of you. It would be wicked of you to kill everyone if there are such righteous people living amongst everyone else. What was the difference between Abraham and Noah? The difference was that Noah basically lost sight of the fact that every human being is created in the image of God. And as such, we have free will. Noah would see a world that was so wicked and so evil, he couldn't imagine that people could ever change. That's why he didn't argue with God. He saw a world that was basically lost. And as far as he was concerned, it was a lost cause. As far as Abraham was concerned, it's never a lost cause. Human beings, you don't give up on them. And if people are given the chance to change, and people who can help them change, they can change. And that's why Abraham is tapped for the job. Abraham believes that people can change, and God says, your nation is going to be that agent of change. Your nation, your people are going to be a blessing to the rest of the world. And so our nation, our history, has been an extremely idealistic vision. And for me, as a young idealistic kid, basically, this captured my imagination. Wow, look at this. I belong to a people that for the last 3,300 years has sacrificed to advance this mission of being a light to the world and making the world a better place. And there was something else about Judaism that was impressive to me. I had to be honest and admit that as a hippie, my idealism was very random and very sloppy. When did I get a chance to actualize my idealism? If I got into a debate with someone about the war in Vietnam, there I could be idealistic. Or if someone organized a protest or a demonstration, then I could manifest my idealism. But that was basically it. And what I was impressed with was that Judaism was a holistic, integrated system that allows us to practice, cultivate, and manifest our idealism 24-7. That appealed to me. Because I don't want to live a life that is split apart. And I can only be idealistic at some times, but not all the time. The fact that we have a system that allows us to thoroughly integrate our idealism into every single moment of life, to me, was a beautiful thing. So my journey to Judaism was basically political. It was basically political. I signed on because I saw in our people an opportunity to serve the world. But I'll be honest with you, this is not the issue for most of the people that I meet in my work. For most of the people that I meet, their objections to Judaism are not political, they're quite something else. The most common thing that I hear from people is that I'm not really interested in religion. I'm interested in spirituality. And clearly, people assume that the two are mutually exclusive. A wise person once put it in the following way. He said, the difference between religion and spirituality is like the difference between reading the menu and eating the meal. No one gets filled or nourished by reading the menu. And for too many people, Judaism is just like reading the menu. It doesn't fill them up. There's a woman in Israel today who's one of the most popular Jewish authors around. She's very popular on 
the internet. She's written several wonderful books. Her name is Sarah Yocheved Rigler. She's about my age. She grew up not far from me in New Jersey. And she spent about 17 years on a Hindu ashram. That was her spiritual journey. After high school, basically, she headed east. And through some amazing things that took place, she ended up from there in Jerusalem and now fully immersed in Jewish life in Jerusalem. And I once heard an interview with her where she was asked the following question. She was asked, what was it for you growing up that was missing from Judaism that you ended up basically becoming a Hindu? And she said, she answered this question with two words. She said there were two things that were missing. She said God and growth. So let's explore for a minute what she meant. I believe what Sarah Rigler was saying was that she had a basic Jewish upbringing. She learned quite a bit about what are the practices of Judaism. But she never saw a connection between, for example, lighting Shabbat candles and becoming a more patient person. She never saw a connection between eating matzah on Passover and having more inner peace. She didn't see the connection between any of the things she learned about that we as Jews do and helping her become more sensitive, more humble, becoming more generous, having more gratitude. These are the elements of our personality development. You know, when we see a little baby and you look at that little tiny baby from the time it's a zygote, and you watch it over the next 10 years. Isn't it amazing what happens to people during those 10 years? I mean, the transformation, the development, physical, emotional, intellectual. I mean, on so many levels, there's almost no comparison between a 10-year-old and a baby just born. And then look at a 10-year-old kid, and over the next 10 years, what happens? A 10-year-old kid, you're a little brat talking back to your parents. At 20, you could be married. Tremendous growth between 10 and 20. It's it's mind-blowing. But look what happens to people between 20 and 30, 30 and 40, 40 and 50, 50 and 60, 60 and 70. Do they really change? They may get a little bit heavier, maybe more gray, maybe less hair. But I think it's safe to say that if you have a person with anger issues in their 20s, there's a good chance they're going to be impatient in their 30s and 40s. And if you have an arrogant person in their 30s, there's a good chance they're going to be just as arrogant in their 40s and 50s. It's not easy to change, especially once our our character traits have become rooted in our personalities. And what Sarah Rigler was saying was that she, growing up, exposed to the teachings of Judaism, was never taught what does any of this have to do with personal spiritual growth? That was one part that was missing for her. But the other word she said was God. She said, growing up, God was missing from my Jewish life. Let me give an example from someone I know a little bit better. The woman I'm married to. So my wife grew up in Ohio, Parents both taught Hebrew school. She had a bat mitzvah. And after she finished university, she went traveling. And she went basically to live in Bali and India for about nine months. She came back to North America, and her spiritual path was essentially what I would call Hinduism light. She was meditating, doing yoga, going to ashrams, meditating. And one day she was listening to WBAI radio in New York, listener-sponsored radio, and they had a program every Sunday morning where they had a spokesperson from a different religion that would present. And she used to listen to the show, and then she hadn't heard for many, many months. And now she turns on on Sunday morning, and it's a rabbi from Israel speaking in Hebrew. And it was a translator, and she's listening to this rabbi speak, and she told me, She was shocked by what she heard. 
And at one point, she basically shot back in her chair, and she essentially said to herself, wow, I never knew Jews believed in God. That was her reaction to what the rabbi was saying. And when I asked her about this, I said, what do you mean by that? She said, sure, I, I heard the word God uttered in my family in synagogues, but it was just a word. It was just a word. It wasn't real. I never heard anyone speak about having a relationship with God, getting close to God, feeling the presence of God in your life. It was just a word. And she said, listening to this rabbi, God seemed real to him. But I think that this is not just an issue for people like my wife, who never really learned growing up. But I think that it's a problem for what we could call the more committed Jewish communities as well. For observant Jews, for religious Jews. The Talmud says something interesting. The Talmud says, Afilu reikonim shebahem mileim mitzvot kerimon. Even the emptiest of them is as full of commandments as a pomegranate. Right? We all know that if you cut open a pomegranate, it has exactly 613 seeds. If you don't have 613, you can get your money back. But the Talmud says that even the emptiest Jews are as full of commandments as a pomegranate has seeds. Now, when you think about this, isn't this a peculiar thing to say? Meaning, if someone has so many commandments, how do you call them empty? Why does it say, even the emptiest of them? How do you call someone that's full empty? So Rabbi David Pavarsky offered the following way of thinking about this statement. He said, think about the difference between eating a pear and eating a pomegranate. When you eat a pear and you bite into that pear, your teeth, your lips, your tongue, everything you encounter is pear kite, is pearness. It's all pear. You're just completely encountering a pear or a banana or an apple. But when you eat a pomegranate, it doesn't have that kind of holistic experience. All you encounter are these disparate, separate seeds. And what he understood the Talmud to be saying was this, that if you are not unifying your observance of the commandments, if they're not all subsumed under the rubric of connecting to God, then even though you might have 613 commandments, you could be very empty spiritually. Maybe some of you had this experience. When I think about it, it makes me cringe. But I've sometimes worked on an email, and it's, it was a difficult email that I had to really work hard on, and it was very long. And foolishly, instead of doing it on a word processor, I did it in the email program. You know, I'm working for an hour, an hour and a half, and I'm, you know, probably knocked off two pages to a very sensitive, difficult email, and I'm about to press the send button, and the program times me out, and it's all poof, it vanishes. <laughs> it's the most frustrating thing in the world. And I always tell myself, next time, use the word processor. But I've done this more than once. How many times do people engage in acts of mitzvot, and they fail to send the press button. They've, they fail to press the send button. The Sefer, the book, Bilvavi Mishkan Evne, My Heart, I Will Construct a Sanctuary, tells us that our Yetzahara, our personal adversary, our internal adversary, is thrilled with all of the commandments that we do. It's thrilled with every mitzvah that we do. As long as we don't think about what the goal of the commandment is, 
where it's supposed to be taking us. You know, we speak about Jewish life as halacha. Halacha is a path. It's supposed to be going somewhere. The Torah, Judaism, is supposed to be taking us somewhere. And if we're not thinking about where it's supposed to be taking us, you could be very religious, but not very spiritual. And the Zohar teaches that the purpose of all the commandments, the Zohar tells us that there are tar yag mitzvot, 613 commandments, it calls them in the Zohar tar yag itin, 613 advices. Advice about what? Advice about how to connect yourself and attach yourself to God. You know, Simcha Bunim Peshischa tells a very cute story. He says there was a very wealthy person that had a mishigas. He had a crazy idea that I have to own the best horse in the world. So he sends out his representatives and they go all over Europe trying to find the most expensive, best, magnificent, fabulous horse on the planet. And they do. They find this horse that is so amazing, so expensive, and they buy it for him. So he says, you know what? Now that I have this uh, extra amazing horse, I've got to have a very special stable for it. So he gets these people to build the most magnificent stables that most people would have loved to live in. And he says, but I have to have security. So he invests in a very expensive lock. And then he says to himself, but you know what? Any lock can be picked. I've got to hire a security guard. So he hires someone to watch the stable that's got the lock on it. He's going to pay someone to sit and watch the stable. Finally, he thinks, all right, I can go to sleep now. So he goes to sleep, but it's midnight and he's tossing and turning. He says to himself, wait a minute, it's late at night already. How is this guy going to stay up all night? Maybe he's fallen asleep already. So he puts on his bathrobe and he goes out to the barn and he sees that this person's still awake. And he says, thank God, that's great. He says, let me ask you a question. How do you keep yourself up at night? It's late. So he says, you know what I do? I ponder very, very difficult questions. I, I think about puzzles and questions that are very difficult to figure out. So he says, well, what were you thinking about? He says, I was wondering when you nail a nail into a wall, what happens to all the wood where the nail is now? There was wood there, but now there's a nail. What happened to all the wood? So the owner of the horse rolls his eyes and says, all right, whatever. <laughs> if it works, keep it up. So he tries to go back to sleep, but he's still tossing and turning. At 2.30 in the morning, he says, this guy's got to be sleeping by now. So he goes back down, and he sees the person still awake. He says, oh, that's great. You're still awake. What are you thinking about now? He says, now? <laughs> he says, I'm wondering, when you get a bagel... So what happened to all the dough that there's a hole there, but there was a dough before. What happened to all the dough? There's a hole there now. So this, he smiles and he says, okay, keep it up. Keep thinking. He tries to go back to sleep, but it's 4.30 in the morning and he, he can't imagine this person still awake at 4.30. So he goes back down another time and he says, you're still awake. Unbelievable. What are you thinking about now? He says, whoa, now? Well, I got a real problem now I'm working on. He says, what's the problem? He says, look, you bought the most expensive horse in the world and you put it in the most magnificent stable in, in the entire universe and you put on this incredible lock and you hired me to watch the horse 24-7. So the owner says, what's your problem? He says, the problem, where's the horse? <laughs> so that's our problem. When you think about it, we have everything these days. We have 10,000 different kinds of kosher food you can eat. And we have every kind of <coughs> convenience, kosher lamps and kosher toothbrushes. And someone invented a sweater that opens up with a zipper. You can put your tefillin under here. And we have kosher vacations and kosher this and kosher that. And we have an internet with 10 million classes you can listen to whenever you want. This, everything is available to us. And yet, for so many of us, we don't have anything. We don't have anything. We have all the details. But where is it taking us to? What's the purpose? What's the goal? What is it doing to me? Going through the motions. And I think for so many of our co-religionists, this begins to eat at them. You know, one day... 
Rav Levi Yitzchak of Bredichev came into a Beit Midrash. He had 200 people studying Talmud, intensely studying Talmud. And he comes in and he stands at the shtender in the front and he gives a clap and he says, Rabbi Sai, there is a gotun himmel. Tells them, don't forget, there's a God. Because people got so, and it happens, you get so caught up with what you're doing. What am I doing? What am I learning? You get so caught up in the trees, we lose the forest behind the trees. The word mitzvah comes from the root tsevet or tzavta, which means connection. The whole purpose of the Torah, the whole purpose of the mitzvot, every single one of them, is to connect us to God. In 2014, Jay Lefkowitz wrote a very important piece in Commentary Magazine called The Rise of Social Orthodoxy. And he describes there that there are a significant number of practicing Jews whose faith and connection to God has been evaporating. Unfortunately, many people who've graduated Jewish day schools and have graduated yeshivot were never exposed, believe it or not, were never exposed to discussions about the foundations of our faith. Not what to believe, but why do we believe it? Is there any basis for our belief? Never been exposed to these discussions. It was just an assumption that was made that Jews believe in God. It was an expectation of the system. But questions were never encouraged, and any questions that were asked were not really met in an approving way. Some people have had negative personal experiences, and some have developed various philosophical problems with believing in God. And so over the next several weeks, what we're going to do is to explore the issue of religious doubt and faith, and whether faith is reasonable, and discuss some of the most serious challenges to faith today. <laughs>